Hi, this is Eric Messerschmidt, ASC. I'm the director of photography on Mindhunter, and you're listening to the Go Creative Show. Hey, everyone. My name is Ben Consoli. I am a director and owner of BC Media Productions. And this is the Go Creative Show, a podcast for filmmakers. So today we've got Eric Messerschmidt on the show. He's the director of photography for Mindhunter. And uh, I know a lot of you guys were excited about this one because we have more questions from the audience in this episode than in any other episode of Go Creative Show. Um, and on that note, uh, if you guys follow us on social media, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, uh, you have an opportunity to have your questions heard on the show. We let you know when we have an upcoming guest and we ask you to submit your questions and you're going to hear a lot of them today. You're also going to hear a lot about Mindhunter. I mean, we talk quite a bit about his pre-production process, his lighting techniques, the camera that he's using, uh, working with David Fincher, and a discussion about how he likes to kind of limit his tool set and the value of doing that, limiting the amount of lenses you have, limiting the type of lighting that you're using. So we talk a lot about kind of his philosophies for lighting and shooting and so much more. Eric is a great guest, and I know you guys are going to love this one. So I'm here with Eric Messerschmidt, ASC. He's the director of photography for Mindhunter. And everyone is losing their mind about this show. They cannot wait for a third season. When we put this, we usually let our audience know who's coming up next and they'll ask questions and things. We've never had more questions from our audience than for you. So that's a testament to your work, but also just the show itself. I mean, welcome to Go Creative Show. And thank you so much for sharing your experiences. Of course. Thank you for having me. That's great to hear. How did you first get involved with Mindhunter? I, I got to know David Fincher when I was the gaffer on Gone Girl. Mm. Uh, I had been working for, for Jeff Cronenwith on that film, and uh, he and I became friends. And um, and when they started the, the first season of the show, they needed someone to come take it over. And, and he gave me a call and, and uh, said, hey, would you come to Pittsburgh and shoot the show? And I said, I'm thrilled to, absolutely. So, uh, yeah, that's kind of, it was a total surprise for me, actually. I had no idea it was, the, the call was coming. So it was, it, was, uh, it was an amazing surprise. Exactly. How do you say no to that, an opportunity to work with David Fincher? I mean, come on. You don't. You don't. Yeah. You, you do not say no to him. <laughs> what, what's it like working with him? I mean, David is great. It's, he, David is exactly what you want um, for so? DP. You know, he, he, is, he is incredibly prepared. He's very precise. He understands technology. He understands um, cinema. Uh, he's an extremely skilled visual storyteller, um, and he's you know he's unbelievably generous and supportive of, of the image and uh, what it is we're trying to do. And he's uh, collaborative and um, and excited about the work. You know, it's it's uh, he checks all the boxes. It's it's been a really fantastic experience for me um, to have the opportunity to work with David. I see you're an Emerson College alum, same as me. I am. <laughs> same. So you've Go spent, Lions. Exactly. <laughs> so you've spent time in Boston. Do, is this is I Boston have, where you're from? I'm from Portland, Maine originally. Just, well, right outside Portland, Maine, a little small town. And um, yeah, I went to I went to Emerson uh, for undergrad, and uh, I love that experience. It was fantastic for me. You know, it was, when I was there, you know, there was a really strong independent film community in Boston, so there was an opportunity for students to go work on micro budget feature films. And I was doing commercials as a crew member. And, you know, it was a great way to kind of, uh, dip my toes into the, into the pool of, of, uh, a career in the film business really early on. And, and I had a great experience at Emerson in general. I mean, the professors were all fantastic. Uh, I, I made really good friendships with students, and, um, you know, people I still take, stay in touch with and work with, uh, today. So yes, yeah, it was a great experience for me. I'm really glad that I did that. Now, Emerson allows you to, well, not allows, but Emerson offers a semester in Los Angeles as one of their programs. I didn't do it. I was foolish. Did you? I did. Yeah. And it was, it was great for me because I was, you know, I, I just, I wanted to get out on a movie set really bad. I, I was, uh, you know, I, I was so obsessed with the idea of being on a big set, being on a big Hollywood set. And I, yeah. I really, um, you know, I thought that was really important when I was a student. And, and so I was eager to get to L.A. And actually through the through the Emerson program, 
I got a job as an intern at Panavision in Woodland Hills. And that was great for me because I was, was really into the lighting side as, uh, as a student. And, you know, um, I was working even uh, uh, as a film technician in Boston, the later years of my, of my uh, college career. But camera was a place that I, I didn't have a lot of exposure, especially 35 millimeter cameras. Mm. So uh, I got a job at Panavision. And that was fantastic. I got to know the guys, you know, the lens techs and the prep techs, and I would build a build a platinum or millennium on the prep floor and follow people around with a geared head, you know, after work. And you know, I, it was they had to kick me out. It was great. I loved that that experience. So you had you had the experience of like the education, the more formal education, plus an experience at Panavision, and your work on sets like that. I I don't think a lot. I think a lot of people will have kind of one or the other. Like they'll, they'll start on sets as a PA and kind of build their way up and almost bypass a film education more traditionally. Then you have others that go the route of just a, a traditional education is the way. What, what do you think? Cause I think there's a lot of filmmakers out there, especially now where everything is so uncertain and you don't even know if you're going to be able to go on campus in the fall. What is your recommendation for people that want to learn, but are a little bit unsure about, a traditional filmmaking education. I don't think film school is the place really where you learn technique. Um, you know, you really need, especially if you're if you're looking for a career in cinematography uh, or directing for that matter, you need technique, uh, mm -hmm. and and that that really comes from practice and experience and watching other people work and uh, having the chance for work to work for other people. So, uh, you know, I I came up through the ranks, so to speak. I, I worked as a grip and as an electrician and and later as a gaffer and. I worked in the stills world quite a bit um, in New York and in L.A. Uh, and so having that opportunity, I think, for me was really helpful because I got to see so many people solve problems. And a lot of those problems are the same. You know, I mean, DPs run into the same problems over and over again. And, and if you watch lots of people work, you get to see them. You get to see those same problems solved in different different ways with different techniques. And that that I think is really helpful. But. But what film school does teach you, um, which you really don't learn in the field, uh, is is taste and and you know you become more cinema literate in film school, which I think is really important, especially if you're going to be a storyteller. You know, if you're going to work on the set, you know those those things are less important to some extent. But um, you want to be able to have an educated conversation with a director or a screenwriter or an actor about what a scene means or you know what it is you're trying to. To explain to the audience or, or or different methods for how you tell the story and 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 that comes from watching movies and talking about movies and and uh and looking at images and learning to be critical of images and all, you know all of those skills that you learn in a formal art school setting or formal film school setting um and and i think also you know in film school you have to present your work to people in a very small group but then that that work is critiqued and that's a really healthy thing to experience i think for for any anyone that's undertaking a creative endeavor you want you want to get used to you need to get used to to presenting work to an audience and and hearing them react to it and and learn how it feels when the work isn't good or or when it's not received well and learn to defend it and all, all of those things mm. so it's sort of i think you know i i i recommend film school you know when people ask me that question but i i don't think that that's the only way and i and i also think it's really important, if at all possible, to get out on a set and watch other people work and learn um, learn the skills. Yeah, I, I agree 100%. I mean, yes, I did go to Emerson, but I didn't do like a more traditional film school route. I sort of, it was almost like a quadruple minor. Like I didn't really major in anything. I sort of minored in a bunch of stuff. So it was a little bit of audio, web design, filmmaking, editing, all this other stuff. So I got like a cool. good, it was kind of like the, uh, you know, oh God, what's the saying? Like master of nothing, j jack of all trades, master <laughs> of nothing type of a thing. Sure. And then, and then after yeah. that, I, I started going on set and started to really define the area that I liked the most. And so I sort of had a non-traditional, traditional education, but it's good. It, it, I'm always interested in just what people's thoughts are on film school, but I think you're entirely right. Like you have to get out there and be on sets. You just do. And the cool thing is, is now you can just kind of go and make a film. Like you have an extremely powerful camera in your pocket at all times. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that 
I was always sort of trying to shoot uh, as a young student or right out, out of school. As, you know, even when I was working as an electrician or a grip, I was always trying to get out there and, and, and you know, shooting friends short films or music videos or, or little things for myself. And, and those are, you know, maybe that reel doesn't land you a big paying job, but that's uh, an opportunity to make a big mistake uh, where the stakes are low. And, um, you know, it's really important to make those mistakes and, and learn from your mistakes and, and be self-critical and look at your work. And, and so I think that's so important, you know, to go out and just be shooting all the time. When did you make the move to L.A. from Boston? Well, I lived in Boston and worked in Boston when I was in college. And then I, I, I did the L.A. program and I never went back. I oh, so you LA. stayed right. What did you do it yeah. as your last senior year semester? I did it my last semester. Yeah. Well, actually, I mean, I, I was I was sort of by coastal living. I, I was I, I was living in New York uh, simultaneously and sort of as I transitioned, I was go going back and forth. I had a small apartment here in L.A. and I, I had a little place in New York and I was kind of going back and forth and kind of just trying to hustle basically and work. Mm. I, I was working in, in the stills world a little bit early on, and 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 that most of that work was in New York City. So I was doing that, um, but uh, yeah, I guess it was. I mean, almost twenty years ago now, mm. two thousand and two thousand and two. So right off the yeah. heels of college, you went right exactly, there. Exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah. How are you feeling right now in the midst of COVID nineteen? All production is shut down. Some states are starting to open up a little bit here and there, but are you hearing anything about production? And when things are going to open up again, I know Georgia, I mean, a lot of filming is in Georgia, but what, what are you hearing? Uh, there's a lot of concern, you know, people are worried and, and, uh, you know, the traditional movie set is not a place where you can exercise social distancing and get a lot done. Yeah. So I think everyone is putting their heads together and thinking, okay, how, how can we continue to make content, um, of doing it responsibly and, you know, it's a tricky thing. I, I, I think in the interim, you know, at, at least in the immediacy, it, there's it's an opportunity for everyone to really pause and and work on their ideas and and think about how we're going to progress forward. You know, given the circumstances, uh, I don't know of anything that's starting up anytime soon. I, I I think it's really important to exercise caution, and, and you know, we have to protect the crew members and the cast, and and you know. First and foremost, everyone's health and safety, and and then we'll you know we'll figure it out. Everyone will get back to work, and there will be a market for for content, and people will continue to want to work. You know, so, it, um, but I think uh, you know right now is is a good opportunity for everyone to just you know, look at what the situation is, reevaluate how as we do things, and and figure out how to move forward. What are you binging right now? <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I uh, we are. Uh, Honestly, watching lots of old movies. That's the lots way to do it. Movies. That is yeah, the way to do it's it. Been, the, the Criterion Channel app on the Apple TV has been uh, kind of a lifesaver in this whole circumstance. And, um, and it's been fantastic. And we watched Gilda the other night, um, Clute, uh, Some Like It Hot, Casablanca. You know, just been sort of going through um, old movies. And movies I hadn't seen before, too, you know. Um, uh, I, it's, it's been it's been great because I kind of, you know as as great as the as as episodic TV the streaming episodic TV world is for all of us content creators and and the opportunities it gives to younger filmmakers and the opportunities it gives to writers and you know and I think the the long form um, format is is fantastic for for storytellers there I I think I really believe that like we got to watch old movies and see how it was done and learn from it and remind ourselves of that, that that's what, you know, um, of that history and, and the significance of that history as much as possible. So it's been great for me, you know, just go, go, you know, check out for an hour and a half and watch an auto Preminger film or something. You it's, know? <laughs> it's so important to do. And like, I mean, I'm, I'm not doing it as much as I want because it's so tempting to go and watch Tiger King. It's right there and yeah, everyone's talking totally. about it and you know it's going to be entertaining and you're like, oh, this, it's just, this, when you're stressed out and nervous, there's nothing more satisfying than just a ridiculous TV show. <laughs> it's, just, it's, it's, to, it's so true. Yeah, I mean, don't get me wrong. I mean, we're, you know, I watched my fair share of Tiger King as well. Of course. So, you know. Love, yeah. it, love It or Listed is the show I can't stop. Like, I, I don't binge it, but that's like, if it's on and I'm scrolling through the channels, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not changing it. It's the most satisfying sure. nothing show 
that I can't, I just feel like calm and good when I'm watching it. I feel like the, everything is good in the world <laughs> when I watch that show. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. A little reminder of normalcy is, is healthy. Well, sure. a lot of people are certainly binging Mindhunter. So let's transition into that and talk about it. Um, sure. Were you the original DP for the show? Because we've got a question here from Instagram. Um, Ivan.videos is asking, why weren't you the original DP for the show? Is that true? That's uh, the, uh, that's true. I was not the original DP for the show. Christopher Probst shot the, the pilot in the first episode. Uh, and then uh, he, he left the show and I took it over on the third. The oh, third so episode. he just did the pilot. I, that's not unusual for that's somebody right. to do the pilot and then no. hand it off. Okay. So, no, no, no. All right. exactly. so that makes sense. So, well, let's talk about that in that situation. So a pilot's made, sure. there's clearly you define the look of the show at that point. Um, you come on at episode two and, and beyond how are you sort of incorporating what's been there, the baseline look, and then also kind of injecting your own look into it? The DP's job uh, is is to exercise the director's vision and the creator's vision, and you know, in the case of TV show, uh, and then interpret that and apply your own aesthetic taste and sensibility, and and, um, and then you work with the with the directors down the road, and you help them sort of bridge that gap between what it was that was created in the pilot. Um, and then, uh, and then, and then you, you carry that forward, you know, um, you know, in the case of Mindhunter specifically, um, I came in and, and we did, we reshot, uh, portions of the pilot, uh, and the second, second episode, uh, David and I, uh, together. And, and it was an opportunity that was, that was sort of my first opportunity on Mindhunter to work with David directly and, and figure out what it was we were really trying to do and put together for the show. Mm. And, and where we saw the show um, existing. Um, and, you know, it's, I, I think it's about visual reference and sensibility and, you know, a huge, a huge part of aesthetic is, uh, is just working practice. Um, you know, what sort of technique you're using. And, and I think personally, you know, when, when you talk about like a look of the show or whatever, right. I think it's, it's really about what you're choosing not to do and not what you're choosing to do. How do you mean? Um, you know, what, you, what, well, it's like you make choices of, of what you'll exclude. Uh, for example, what, what specifically like technique, you know, uh, we're, we're, we're going to minimize our use or it's, it, eliminate handheld. We won't use the steady cam. Uh, we will, we'll really focus on structured organized uh, set frames and allow the actors to work within the frame. We won't follow the actors, things like that. Uh, we're going to, we're going to use a lot of top light. Uh, we'll exclude certain tonal colors from, from the image. And, you know, so it's like, I, I think that if, if you work, if you work at it from that perspective, as opposed to here are the things we will do, um, it leaves it a little bit more open-ended and it makes it harder to manage the aesthetic, you know? So, um, for us, it was pretty easy. You know, it was like, okay, well, we're gonna, we're not gonna move the camera very much. We will work with really organized, structured frames. We're gonna enforce composition. Uh, we'll frame for the backgrounds and 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 place the actors in the shot, and and we'll work that way. And then, um, and as long as we maintain that style of of approach, working practice, then the aesthetic gets automatically informed. Um, and and I think you end up chasing your tail less. Of when you work that way. Um, and there are exceptions to the rule. There's some handheld in the show and we do move the camera, of course. And there's, you know, instances where thematically or, or plot wise, it was necessary to, to change those things a little bit. So, so it was, you know, we were really uh, trying to be open-minded as well in, in terms of making sure that we're focusing on what the story is and focusing on the, on the, uh, on what it, what it is we're really trying to explain to the audience. But, but in terms of specific aesthetics, it was definitely like, what are we not going to do? What does this world look like? What are the tonal range of this world look like? And, you know, it, it helps when you have costume designers and production designers and, and hair and makeup people and set decorators that are all on the same page, you know. We have a question specifically about camera movement for the show from Josh sure. Bader on Instagram. Can you talk about camera movement in the show? It's extremely smooth and always seems to be perfectly planned and executed. You brush on it a little bit right here. Um, obviously, that was what was set in the pilot, but you continued it on. And uh, what's your strategy behind camera movement? What does it do to the story? Well, David and I felt like the the show really needed to be 
it needed to be told from an objective point of view. In, in other words, we, it, I, I think that anytime you have camera movement this late, like the dolly lands after the, after the actor or the tilt up is late when someone stands or the, the frame is following someone, uh, what that says to the audience is that someone is operating the camera. There's another person in the room. The audience is smart enough now to recognize those, those mistakes. And the audience, to some extent, has come to accept those mistakes as, as just modern filmmaking. But if you look at the you know, classic films, particularly, you know, uh, and even you know, into the 70s, you had really precise operating and precise operating uh, rel- relative to the blocking. So we, um, we would rehearse that. And the actors worked with, with the camera operator and the dolly grip to, to figure out when they're going to stand up, when they're going to lean forward, when they're going to uh, you know, lean in like this. Uh, you know, specific beats within the scene. And then they would practice those moves with the operator and really work it out. And I think what you get, if you're really diligent about following that idea, is you get a very precise, almost um, perfect compositional style that that uh, completely eliminates the operator from the equation and allows the actor um, to to directly communicate with the audience through the frame, so to speak. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Um, so you know that's that was that's sort of the the theory that you know the psychology behind it. Uh, but just in, in, there's no magic. It's just just straight practice and and discipline. You know, but particularly on the actors' uh, side, you know, they're really helpful and they were they were on board and they participated in this process and they saw the value in it. So you know, it's it's very technical acting. It's it requires a tremendous amount of skill mm. to to execute that kind of thing. I want to talk about the camera package you use on the show. Um, and why? Tell us, what are you using? The first season we shot uh, 6K on the Dragon sensor um, and uh, on, on Leica Similux Primes, which was something Chris had worked out with David in the, in the pilot, and we continued. Um, and then we, we changed to Helium in the second season, the Helium sensor in 8K, uh, but we uh, stuck to the, the Similux. We really liked the quality of those lenses, and, and we became quite accustomed to those focal lengths working those focal lengths. We sort of restricted our coverage to uh, three or four. We, you know, pretty much everything in the show is shot on the 25, 29, 40, and 65 millimeter lenses. And I think when you really restrict, again, you restrict your use of, of focal lengths, you know, that, that informs the aesthetic. Uh, but, you know, people ask a lot. We, we did build some custom cameras for the show. We, we built uh, what we nicknamed the Xenomorph, which was a all, all in uh, enclosed um Sort of mono mono body style camera that had the transmitter, the the uh, the time code locket box, uh, the uh, the MDR for the focus and iris, uh, everything in in close. So there's there's no cables, which is fantastic way to work. You know, it's not dissimilar really from uh, from a Panaflex. You know, you put the put the lens on the front and the magazine and the camera and the battery on, and you can go. And, and that was really the intention of, of that system, um, which the guys at Red. Um, put together for us. So, it, it so was you, fantastic. It was you fantastic. built that with red. It, was that something, something custom that you made just for your shoot for your yeah, show? Exactly. Well, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, David had been working on the Xenomorph, um, design, uh, long before, uh, Mindhunter began. And then they, they implemented it, uh, at, at the very beginning of, of the first season of Mindhunter and what we kind of now refer to as the Mark one Xenomorph. Um, which was actually, believe it or not, designed for handheld work. And then we we learned a bunch of things from that design, and we made some changes in the second season, and, and we designed the Mark II, which is uh, which, which had some upgraded cooling. It had the AK sensor in it. Uh, we changed uh, video transmission systems. Um, yeah. Well, um, Eli Cooper Film on Instagram wants to know what sets apart the Xenomorph from just a regular red camera system. What are the differences? Uh, well, the 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 capture technology is identical the sensor technology is the same as as what you would see in a in a regular dsmc2 body um it is strictly about logistics and um working methodology on the set and minimizing the amount of bullshit on the camera that the camera system has to deal with basically you know it's you look at any modern motion picture camera you know be it an alexa or a red or a sony venice or, or what have you and and in most cases it's completely covered in cables and third-party boxes for video transmission and follow focus. And, um, you know, they become uh, quite the rat's nest quickly. Even if you have a really clean build, uh, you know, assistants are often, you know, they're moving 
arms around and onboard monitors and changing bracketry. And, and you know, it, it's very difficult to get the assistant's camera, hands off the camera uh, throughout the day. And, and I think what we felt was just, it just ends up being a bit of a time suck, in all honesty. And, and we really wanted to streamline the whole system what, without giving up what all those sort of peripherals give the, the filmmaker. You know, wireless video is, is unbelievably helpful. <laughs> And it was something we didn't want to not not have, uh, you know, time code as well, uh, wireless focus. Obviously, those those three things are really important, and they they continue to be important in, in modern filmmaking. But but we we said, well, look, there's got to be a better way. Yeah. Um, so that's that's where that that idea came from. Keeps you moving faster, less less nonsense on there. Yeah, I mean, look, it's David's priority, um, and I think it should be the DP's priority is is to maximize the amount of time the director has with the actor. You know, you want to be shooting as much as you possibly can. The, any, the time you're not shooting is, is time that never really ends up on, in the film. Uh, you know, obviously there's lighting time that's necessary. Obviously rehearsal time is necessary. But if you can minimize those moments between the moments, it's, it's really crucial to the, to the progress of the day. You know, there's the famous quote, uh, it's, it's not the time to take the takes that takes the time. It's the time between the takes that takes the time. Yeah. Well, <laughs> so, <you> let, <laughs> let's talk about those takes because we actually have a lot of questions here about that. Um, multiple people want to talk about just the amount of takes that you took. Some people are saying, how did you manage? But we have Micah Kozlensko. Um, how do you manage Fincher's many takes on exteriors with changing light? We have somebody, what scene had the most takes? Uh, do you do full scenes for each take? There's a lot of talk about takes, takes, takes. Um, sure. I guess the big thing here is that there's, you know, he's notorious for having a lot of takes. Uh, David Fincher is. So start there and <laughs> maybe just address some of these questions as you go. Well, it's look, it's been slightly overstated, the amount of takes. It's It has been hyperbolized, I think. Uh, but... But yeah, David is precise, and he is he is interested in in the pursuit of perfection. I think as we all should be. I you know I what you know what we're doing when we you know we, it's not a stage play. You don't get to run it again the next night. So if you have the opportunity to do another one and and try something, especially for the actor to explore something, or or you have the the opportunity to you know the you might do six takes and the operator might blow the stand up on four of them. So if you're interested in quality operating. That means you can only use two of them, right? Yeah. So, so when you look at it from that perspective, holistically, in terms of not just the performance, but the position of that extra in the background, or the, or the the continuity of someone's lapel, or 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 a hair flyaway, or whatever. If you look at it from that that perspective, and you want everything to fall into place as close as possible, ten, twelve takes starts to seem very reasonable. You know, it's the people that do three or four takes in most cases are letting a lot of stuff slide, which I think is unfortunate because uh, you can only use one of those takes in, in the movie and, and you, want, you want it to be as, as good as possible. You know um, there is truth to the fact that, yeah, we, we were probably doing more takes than most people in most, in most cases. And I think that is, is why the show looks the way it does. And it was something that uh, not just David was doing, but, but all the directors came to really, um, accept and and continue with uh and you know it was something that the actors liked the actors liked the opportunity to do it an, a, another time and try something and explore the scene and really get into it and you know a lot of the scenes are in mindhunter are really long so you have you know it can be difficult to maintain that performance or the or that or, or continuity over the course of an eight or nine minute scene uh so in some cases yeah i mean the answer to the question are we doing the entire scene yes in most cases we didn't do a lot of pickups and that that was true for most of the directors, but I think it's because the scenes are complex and and oftentimes very nuanced. So you need the, the actors actually need the entire scene to get through the process of performing it. Uh, and I think you know the anatomy of a good scene is 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 it it can live as its own as its own little short film. So you need that that dr dramatic arc uh, within within the take. Uh, for, for contextually to, to work, you know? Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, you know, it's a style and it informs the aesthetic and, and we are, we are anticipating that like in prep. So, you know, if we know we're going to do a lot of takes and we're going to do a lot of coverage, um, 
it, it affects how how I would prep or how I would plan for things. Absolutely, you know, and, and the day exterior thing is absolutely a place where that becomes more complex and, and slightly more difficult to execute. I definitely want to talk about the day exteriors, but just one more question about the takes. Is it mostly for performance tweaks? Like, d- does he want to do multiple takes in order to try different things out on set, almost use it as a working rehearsal? Or is it more to really hone in on extremely small, minute details? Because that's, I think that's a completely different approach. Doing a million takes and saying, try it this way, try it that way, try it this way, that's different than saying you you got it 90% of the way, now we got to work on that 10. You know, do you know what I'm saying? My question was hard, yeah, yeah, but you absolutely. know what I'm saying? Yeah. Well, it's, it's, it's not, I mean, I have, I have lived it now. I've seen, I've seen this technique for years and, and it's been my experience that, uh, well, there's a couple things that happen. One thing that, that happens is actors stop performing and they start kind of living the scene and you really see mm-hmm. it. And, and, and there are, look, there are actors that are great uh, for the first four takes, and then their performance falls apart. There yeah. are other actors that that where it gets better, um, but if you don't do the, if you don't do spend the time, you don't learn that, mm. you know. Uh, and and I think so. I think that that's that's one aspect of it that really helps uh, the the film, and it helps the actor. The other the other thing is that particularly in scenes that are nuanced and complex and require um, a very, they require kind of a discerning, uh, discerning eye on, on what the, what the scene means. Um, it takes time to work through it and figure out where the dramatic beats are. So it's not like let's, let's flip 180 degrees on between take five and take six. I see what was working there. Let's pursue that idea a little bit further here. Let's, you know, and you, you sort of, with, with each subsequent uh, opportunity to play the scene, the scene generally, in my experience, gets better. Mm. You know, you get uh, the the actors understand what they're saying um, with with more with with more confidence. Uh, the operating gets better. You know, you know the the performance starts to feel more natural, especially if you're asking someone to do something very. You know, if you're applying some sort of choreography to the scene. The way someone pulls a wallet out of their pocket, you know, it's like it's we've done it so many times, you know, you get a great scene and then the actor pulls out the FBI badge and it's upside down or it's backwards. And, oh, my God. And, you know, that, you know, that so it's like those things matter. And and the other thing, too, is that if the actor is, is delivering an amazing performance. But uh, the extra in the background is doing something ridiculous. Uh, that's unfortunate for the for the actor. And. And that's something you want to minimize as much as possible, but you don't want to force the cut in post and 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 not allow that actor to live that moment in that entire take. You know, it it, it might be unbelievably powerful in the scene to run it eighty percent of the way in in one shot and then cut away for a couple of reactions. But if 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 you're cutting, you know, for continuity or or for um for you know a blown uh, a blown mark or or whatever, you're you're not giving that actor the full opportunity to present, you know, their skill on camera. And, and I think a lot of people don't really recognize that, you know, and that that's unbelievably valuable for the film because you, you don't, you never, you want to make editorial decisions based on content. You don't want to make editorial decisions based on mistakes. I like that idea for sure. I also think it's kind of funny, the idea of extras blowing takes. <laughs> like, yeah, it happens all the time. You know, That is going to be the most annoying thing in the world. And it's you guys. I mean, you guys are working at the highest level of cinematography and filmmaking here. And some extra screws up a take. It must drive you crazy. Yeah, it's hard. I mean, look, it, in in my, in many cases, the extras don't know. You know, I can see you trying desperately. How do I say yeah. this the nicest way possible? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I mean, look, it's these people are are giving. You know, they're giving part of their day, they, they have a, another day job or they're a student or whatever, and they're going to come and, and, and in, you know, especially outside of Los Angeles, they're not professional actors. Or maybe they've never been on a movie set before. So it's, it's a lot of pressure, you know, especially if you yeah. give them something specific to do. So, uh, you have to be, um, you have to remind yourself of that and, and diplomatic, and that's, but that's part of the benefit. Yeah, of course. But you, you know, it's like, but when you set yourself up to do multiple takes like that and, and give your, you know, make that, make, make the pursuit of perfection part of the process, 
Mm -hmm. uh, it allows for those things to happen with less pressure. Yeah. Let's talk about the um, exteriors. When you're outside, you're doing a million takes. How are you keeping consistency? And that was a question. I want to give credit credit where it's due. Um, Mike Kozlenko on Instagram wants to know this, and it's a great question. Is cinematographers are, you compromise the second you get out of bed in the morning. Uh, you know, it's, it is a, it, it is this endless game of, of, of odds and you are trying to plan for the worst, you know, every situation you walk in, okay, what is going to go wrong here? Mm. Um, and, you know, fortunately the one thing we can plan on is where, where is the sun going to be on any given day? And, uh, and you plan around those things that you can't control, you know? So it's, it's for, you know, for, for Mindhunter, and there are scenes uh, more so in the first season, but there are some exteriors in the second season that are pretty long and pretty complex. Some of them we shot over multiple days uh, so that we could shoot all the same coverage in the same sun position. Some mm -hmm. places we blocked and cheated. Uh, you know, we tried really hard. Uh, I didn't, I didn't want to cheat light direction very much in the show. I felt like it was, um, sort of, you know, Gordon Willis was kind of the master of this, who really, like, would light it once and, and move the camera around the, around the set and, and let it be what it was, what it was and embrace the source, so to speak. And, uh, you know, we're doing that with the sun as well. So there, you know, there are instances where most of the scene is backlit, for example, and then you turn around and we go with the front light. Um, you want to go with the front light when it's in the best possible position, mm. but, uh, but, you know, it's all about planning. And, and, you know, that's the other thing is, is, you know, the directors um, came in with a plan and, and we executed the plan in most cases. And we spent a lot of time prepping and, and we, would, we would really scout for the sun and, and scout for the backgrounds and, and, and make that part of the process. But, you know, there were times where it's like, hey, if we're going to get this next piece and we've just done 15 takes, you have to think about the other uh, the other seven pieces of coverage that we need when that sun is there. So, you know, you, you work with the AD and you work with the director and figure out what, what time you need to move on to make sure that the sun is in the right place at the best time for all the pieces of coverage. So in your, sense. in your prep, you must just be planning, like you must know which scenes are going to get a million takes. You, you probably just know it from working on the show for so long. Yeah. I mean, it's, <sighs> And by the way, David's not directing every single one. I mean, you have other right. you have other directors as well. Does that same sort of process carry on to other directors as well? The multiple takes that we've been talking about. Yeah, I think all the directors embrace that idea. Hey, look, I think every director wants to do another one. Yeah, you know that's that's a misnomer. This like spontaneity thing. I mean, maybe there's a couple out there that 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 think they get the best work in the first two takes. Uh, it has not been my experience that that's the truth. Uh, you know, it's definitely been my experience that, that, uh, with practice comes, uh, you know, uh, the takes improve, mm. um, or at least the opportunity to explore it and see if it improves is, is something that directors want and yeah. actors in most cases want, you know? Uh, so yeah, I think having an environment where that was a supported idea, the directors were, were, were excited to take that on. Um, you know, what you had was a crew that was very used to that and, and very used to working quickly. Yeah. So that they, the directors, we maximized the time the directors had on the set, but uh, you know, and, that, and that's, that's just part of the process of the show. You know, it's like directors are up against the wire, just like a DP is, you know, you're, you're constantly trying to, trying to plan for, for how much time you have and you never have enough. So it's um, uh, you know, but if, if, if the time is there to explore the scene, you have a six page scene, you're going to shoot it over the course of 10 hours. Um, and you, and you are set up to where, where you, the logistics of the set are, are fast enough where you, you know, you can be rolling four hours a day or five hours a day in some cases. That's fantastic for a director. And Hey, if they finish early and they got it in, in, in four takes, I mean, no one was telling the directors, Hey, you, you got to do 15, no, no less than 15 takes. Sure. You know, that yeah. never happened. There are many instances where directors were, were happy in, in five or six. That's when I. I, I mean to say it's been overblown and that th there is definitely truth to that, but we gave everybody the opportunity to, to, uh, to make sure that they got the best, best they could out of the day's work. You know, I've got a couple questions about the, um, uh, comping multiple shots in to the same, um, uh, or multiple takes into the same shot and post. Uh, sure. 
Can we talk about that a little bit? Uh, Ismail on Instagram, can you talk about using two takes to match them into one in post? And then we also have uh, William Hart on Instagram. Do you know what comp effects will be added to a shot? And does that change the way you shoot? So I think kind of, oh, you might sure. be able to answer both of those in the same, uh, yeah. same answer. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we use split screens a lot. You know, sometimes it's to fix a continuity issue. You know, you might have a, a two shot on a table and, and uh, the candlestick got moved inadvertently or whatever, you know, from take three to four. And um, so those things, you know, were done. Sometimes it's to, it's to change the pacing of the scene. You know, it's right. like, I think uh, from, look, I'm not a director, but, but I definitely think it, it is difficult sometimes to judge uh, pace on the set in terms of like whether or not the rhythm of the scene is working um, and and good editors can can help with that. And sometimes, you know, you have to accelerate the pace. And, and if you, you have two actors in, in a two shot, it can be difficult to accelerate the pace because they're, you know, you can't cut necessarily to speed that up. Yeah. But the the opportunities of using a split screen helps with that. So you have the split screen thing. And there's a lot of cases where we knew that was happening or we knew, you know, in advance that we were going to do that. Um, in most cases, though, I think that, that that's a decision that's done in post when you're trying to make the scene work better. You know, the editor is is trying to, to work it out. And, you know, again, it's like I think you got to use every trick in the book, in, yeah. it, you know, in terms of, of delivering the best possible scene you can to the audience. So, you know, nothing is off limits. The precision of the operating helps with that, though. You know, it's like when we're when we're executing very specific frames, um, you know, that that makes the that makes the. Um, the compositor's job uh, a lot easier because we're sort of registering the frame in very specific places. Um, you know, when it comes to set extension or comp work, uh, yeah, we always knew we were going to add trees in the background or or add a city skyline or or erase some buildings. And you know, we did stuff. We, you know, we were shooting with multiple cameras in many cases, and and we would put cameras in the frame, uh, particularly on exteriors to help with you know lighting continuity. Uh, you know, like what we talked about earlier with with uh, the exterior and, and the moving sun. So, you know, we put the B camera in the, in the A camera shot and, and erase it um, or or do a push in and we get a clean plate and then push in and get a, get a second piece of coverage. Did a lot of that kind of work. Um, so, you know, we, we just kind of knew what we could do and we exploited every option, every opportunity, you know? Yeah. I want to transition to speaking about the lighting technique in Mindhunter. Sure. Um, the show has such a distinct look. Like, I mean, that's that's one of the things that people talk about and respond to, I think, is that it has just this look that is so defined. And I'd love to you, I'd love for you to talk to me a little bit about how you came to that look. Now, I know you didn't shoot the pilot, but still you have to maintain it. And um a little bit about your technique and you know what your what lights are employing to sort of create that look. We were we were sort of taken with some mil some films of the 70s. I think we were, you know, we, we liked that kind of stylistic, a little bit of stylistic grittiness, but but also composed composed frames. Um, and, you know, Gordon Willis's work on All the President's Men it was, was a reference we used. Mm. Uh, not quite the 70s, but uh, Mississippi Burning was a movie that we felt was appropriate. Um, Clute uh, is in there, uh, Three Days of the Condor, um, you know, Films of that era uh, felt like appropriate references, and we we used that um, as as sort of a, a a place to jump jump from. And then, you know, I think what what you see on on the screen is a direct result of working practice. It's like okay, we want to be able to we want to be able to shoot large amounts of coverage because the scenes are long. Uh, we are going to embrace naturalism as much as possible. Um, and what I mean by that is like we're going to use uh, practical sources and, and do as little off camera lighting as we can. We're going to we're going to pay attention to lighting continuity and, and we're not going to cheat very much uh, shot to shot. We're going to not do a lot of relighting shot to shot. And, and you know, when you sort of throw those ingredients in the pot, um, you know, it leads to an aesthetic. It, I, it, I think it was more that the look is, comes more from that approach as opposed to we're going to do this. How do we light it for that? You know, it was, mm. it was um, definitely the result of a reaction. Does it surprise you how, 
how positively people respond to it because it's so naturalistic. It's like people are losing their mind about how great this show looks, but really it's so incredibly natural looking. You would think that of all things to respond to, you would respond to things that are maybe so different from what you just see in normal life. I mean, thank you for saying that. I, I, I think, um, I really wanted to, I was trying not, we, we tried, we tried really hard not to be flashy with the photography. And, and I think that it is super problematic. Uh, if, if the, if the imagery steps in front of the story or in front of the performance. So, um, you know, the, the, the visual style of the show is really meant to, um, is, is meant to take a step back and allow, allow the scenes to take shape. And, um, and I think because we were restricted with the choices and we made, you know, we sort of had a very limited color palette and had, um, we used a lot of top light mostly because we were moving around the room so much with the camera that, you know, if we lit it for shape, uh, in, in many cases, it would, it would require tons of relighting and, and it wouldn't really work visually and, and it, w- it would dictate a bunch of editing choices. So we, you know, because we were making those choices, um, you know, that's, that's the way the show looks. It, it's great that people respond well to it. I mean, I, I'm flattered, you know, that's fantastic. It's a lot of people behind the scenes though, that are, that are contributing to that style. You know, it's like, um, in terms of my own end of, of the look, of course, you know, the cinematographer, uh, deserves some credit for the way that the show looks, but also, you know, and certainly in the case of Mindhunter, um, Steve Arnold, the production designer and, and Jen Starzik, uh, costume designer, uh, deserve equal amounts of credit. I mean, they, yeah. they, you know, whatever they're putting in front of the camera, uh, regardless of what I like has, has a color palette and, and a tonal palette that, that is something that we've discussed, but, um, you know, it contributes a huge amount to, to the way the show looks. Yeah. We've had a bunch of, um, production designers on go creative show. And it's one of those roles where people don't really understand how much they're responsible for until you start talking to them and you realize, wow, a lot of the things that I love about this show are under the guidance uh, of the production designer. And certainly yeah, you guys work yeah, in conjunction, absolutely. but it's always amazing to me uh, how people don't necessarily know that till they hear one of the episodes and they realize, wow, I can't believe it's it. It's true. It's true. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, Steve and I became very close on the show and, and we, you know, constantly would go back and forth with ideas about where we could put windows or where we could put the practical lights. And, you know, it's a lot of the scenes, especially the interview scenes in the show are, are, are lit with, you know, overhead fluorescent or some sort of top light. And, and mm. Steve would grab me and he'd be like, Hey man, come into the set. Like, where, where do you think we should put this fluorescent? Or, um, you know, I, I imagine they're sitting here, you know, and the production designer, it, it has a lot of impact on blocking and staging because they're, they're placing furniture in the room and they, they're presenting the set to the director as a, as a possibility for a place where a scene could be played. And, um, you know, and when you have a production designer like Steve who thinks about lighting and thinks about, well, if they sit here, then Eric, Eric's going to want a window here or I should give him a practical or something to work from. Um, you know, that, that has huge implications on, on, on what, how the show looks. Uh, and it makes my job a lot easier, you know? So, so having a, a close relationship with him and, and being on the same page in terms of what it was we were trying to do visually, uh, is unbelievably helpful, you know, and, and that's part of, I think the visual reference ideas and spending time with people in prep and talking about the show and talking about technique and style and all of that. So day interior, what, what are you doing? Are you basically blasting through a window using practicals? Um, we have a question actually from Willborn Film that wants to know your kind of ratio to hard light and soft lights too. Um, how do you just approach a pick a scene, daytime interior? Sure, you know. Sure. Well, I, I, there, I mean, there's a huge range. The answer is we're doing all of that. Um, yeah. You know, uh, there were scenes um, on location day interiors where they were eight pages long. They were going to take two, two days to shoot. One day we knew it was going to be sunny. The other day we knew it was probably going to be cloudy. Yeah. And we tented the windows and we pushed off light through the windows. And, and because the most important thing was we wanted editorial continuity and, and we didn't want to be chasing, changing lighting set, set up to set up. There are other scenes where that wasn't you know really possible. There's scenes in the school, for example, in the first season where we, it's a school. It wouldn't make sense for the windows to be blown out. We wanted to see out the windows and we felt like we could get those scenes done in, in the, in the window of time where, um, 
or we could use the natural light. And, and in those scenes, there are, uh, at least in the school scene, I think it's episode three and four or five and six. Um, it's almost entirely naturally lit. Uh, mm. In terms of hard light, we, I, I used more hard light in the second season because we had scenes that take place in Atlanta and we wanted Atlanta to feel like a different place. You know, the show, it's sort of, it's a little bit of a road movie and they're going around place to place. Yeah. And, and we thought of it, you know, but in, in the second season, they spend a tremendous amount of time in Atlanta. And I don't know if you spent any time in Atlanta, but I, I've spent quite a bit of time there and it's hot and sunny in the summer in Atlanta. And we wanted the audience to feel that, you know, so we used more hard light through windows and um, less tents and, and we were, you know, a little bit more aggressive with the contrasts. And, um, you know, it- so we tried to take, take, you know, location into, into account in, in terms of where the, where the scene takes place in the story. I can imagine that's just fun. Like when you know another season is going to have a large portion of it in a different place, just like change it up. Like you're not going yeah. back to the same old sets. You can have a different look and you have to kind of create a, a separation between the two locations or the, not just two, but you know what I mean? Atlanta and our regular home base. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's part of the thing, you know, but it, I don't look at it like, uh, Oh, I get to do this here necessarily. You know, I look at it like, okay, what's in the script? What is the scene? What do we have to do? What is it? What's significant about it contextually with the other scene? In other words, do we have to show, you know, are we, do we want to not cut to an establishing shot? So we need the audience to immediately recognize where they are. Yeah. You know, there's a place for some stylistic, you know, sort of expressionism in terms of this is what Atlanta looks like. So the audience knows they're now in Atlanta. So you don't have to, you know, cut to the plane flying across the country or whatever. But, you know, it's, um, I think, I think for me anyway, it's like, don't look, I was like, don't look for what I can do. It's like, just read the, read the pages and watch the scene and then figure out what is the bare minimum we have to do in order to tell the story. And and that's, you know, quite honestly, where the look comes from. Hmm. We actually have a question from Wham Bam Studios on Instagram about your shot diagrams and how okay. you're, yeah. I mean, can you talk a little bit about your shot diagrams and I guess your approach to pulling together these scenes in prep. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, well, we did, you know, uh, Mindhunter is, is a show, uh, told in cuts. Um, we weren't really, we weren't doing a lot of, you know, long developing masters or, 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 or oneers. Um, there are some, but, but for the most part, it's, the show is about the built slow buildup of, of drama in, in dialogue scenes. And, I think when you tell a story that way, um, you know, one of the techniques directors use is, is they, is they, they use editing, uh, obviously. And we would, we would do lots of coverage as a result, you know, lots of angles. We'd look at the scene and watch the rehearsal and think, okay, we can do a raking two shot here. We can do a a straight on two shot here. We'll do an orthographic, um, uh, master. We'll do an off center master. We'll do an up high. We can do, we will do close, close singles, um, POVs, and, you know, figure out all the different options that that will assist in telling the story, because, it, you know, it might be that you just use that one close up once in the scene or maybe you don't use it at all. Um, but we we tried to. Try to make that part of the stylistic um, storytelling of the show, which, which was uh, through cuts, primarily static frames, but but through cuts so that the editors could work through the scenes. Um, and I would diagram them in many cases for my own use because I wanted, you know, it's like if I do a 40 millimeter over the shoulder on one side and there's 40 pieces of coverage in the scene, it might be two days before we turn around and get the complimentary 40. Mm. So I have to keep track of where I, where I had the camera, you know? Um, so in some cases, those, the shot diagrams get developed in the blocking rehearsal and we would make a, a coverage plan. In other cases, you know, with other directors, uh, that, uh, that wanted to work different ways, we would, you know, we would, slowly build it and then figure out what the reverse of the scene looked like or, um, but yeah, I mean, I, I would, I would post them a little bit, you know, I was kind of trying to be a little cheeky maybe, but I would post them on Instagram because they're, um, because, you know, there are instances certainly in the show where there's 30 or 40 shots, you know, and, and that, um, uh, that just became kind of part of the style of the show. Well, people love that stuff. Anytime you offer up your, a lot, you know, it's weird. It's like a lot of people want to know about, prep like how are you preparing for scenes how do things change like we have one william hart on instagram how does production change from pre-production planning like 
I get a lot of these questions about, um, uh, what is this? Charango 23 on Instagram, one about storyboard process and are you involved in it? So there's a, there's quite a bit of questions here about just how sure. you prepare for scenes and how involved you are. Um, I know I just threw two questions at you, but I think they're in the same vein. Can you talk to us just a little bit about the way you prepare? And then I want to end our interview with just some lightning round questions about specific scenes that we have here on Instagram. I'm telling you, so much, I've never seen more questions for a guest than for you. So cool. Uh, that means something. So yeah. happy to, to answer. Yeah. Not to sidetrack. Sure. So let's talk a little bit about your pre-production process, involvement in storyboarding. What's your process there? Well, we had a saying, you know, fix it in prep. You know, we had a, I like that. You know, it's like, uh, and, and there was there, it, you know, we were fortunate to have producers that really embraced and supported the, the rehearsal process. So a lot of the longer scenes, the, the actors and the directors had the opportunity to, to work through the scenes and practice and rehearse them. Um, and, and that I think is, is for the most part where you kind of see, the scene take place and where you see the beats that you need to use, you need to tell with the camera and, and where you see the dramatic curves and where you see the power relationships develop, you know, all that stuff happens in the rehearsal. It's, it's very difficult. At least for me, it's really hard to judge those things on the page. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, that's a skill that I, I continue to try to work on, but, um, but for me, I, I kind of have to see the scene up on its feet and, and watch it, watch it take shape. And also, you know, in that rehearsal process as the actors work through it, uh, they were, they refine all those power relationships and all those dynamics. And, and then you see those off camera looks and those, you know, the, the, the looks between actors that, that aren't on pieces of dialogue that oftentimes become pivotal to the storytelling, you know, to the scene itself. Um, you know, you see that in the rehearsal process. So we would, you know, we would prep and work with the director and run the scene and then watch it from every angle. And, you know, if, whether it was Andrew Dominic or Carl Franklin or Andrew Douglas or, or, uh, to, Tobias or whatever, you know, we would we would run the scene and watch it from over Holt McCallany's shoulder, and then we'd run the other scene and watch it over Jonathan Groff's shoulder, and then we'd run, you know, we'd have them run another rehearsal and step back and see and watch what the actors are doing and and build a build a coverage plan based on that. Um, do you do? You know, and then you figure out what it is. Do you do any previs work? Like, do you use Cine Tracer or any of those programs where you can really? basically lay out your entire scene in 3d space. We did, we did some, yeah, we did some previs, um, for the, for the early car work when we were figuring out how to do the car work. We did some previs, uh, you know, previs I think is really helpful if you're trying to illustrate and storyboarding is the same. If you're trying to illustrate something, if you need a visual aid to illustrate something to a production designer, um, a visual effects person, uh, assistant directors, if you're doing a car chase or some big logistical, uh, exercise, you know, where you have to move extras around the streets or, or, or you have stunts, you know, that's, that's for me where, where storyboards really help. Uh, or, you know, in the case of commercials where you're really trying to explain exactly what you're doing because of the, um, because you're being judged, uh, financially, you know, but, it, um, but for a dialogue driven show like Mindhunter, you know, especially with long scenes, it becomes, it's really difficult to storyboard those in advance because, yeah. I think I think well one you owe to the you owe the actors the the courtesy to allow them to work through it and figure out the what what their choreography is going to be within the space what feels natural um, and that's kind of what dictates the camera direction um, but you know in, in really complex action sequences or or visual effects sequences storyboards help because you have to figure out how many visual effects shots you have and you know uh, where you're going to flip the car stuff like that yeah okay. That that all makes sense. I'm I'm like fascinated with Cine Tracer. I don't know if you've if you've I haven't used it, but um Yeah, it's cool. Yeah, it's it, it just cool. it's one of those things I look at it and I was like, oh my God, I want to do this for everything. But then I I'm assuming that once you get started, it's just so complex that you're gonna start saying, Well, I really don't need it for this scene, I really don't need it for that scene. But when you yeah. need it, something like that is absolutely incredible. If you guys listening sure. haven't heard of it, you should check it out for yourself. I think you just go to Cinematography Database. Hold on, let me, I want to give it credit here. CinematographyDB.com and click on Cine Tracer and check it out for yourself. It's really, it's really pretty amazing. Um, that's a random tangent I wasn't planning on, but I just, <laughs> as we're talking about pre-production, it made me think of it. Okay, lightning sure. round in our last few minutes. Devin Dakumar, I'm sorry if I'm saying it wrong, but it's on Instagram. What kind of lighting did you use for the prison scenes? 
Oh, there's so many. Um, I know. I'd say it's, yeah, I'd say just, uh, we, just to satisfy, I would say just pick one and, and go with it. Cause I'm sure we, it's different. We used a lot. We used a lot of cool white fluorescence in the ceilings of prison scenes. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and, um, combined with some cooler light through windows in many cases, but, but it's primarily top fluorescent lit. A lot of top lighting. You've, you brought that up a bunch of times. A lot. Yeah. Yeah. What is top, like, what is top lighting say in, in a story? Like what, what does it articulate visually to the audience that you just can't get from, you know, a side light or something like that? Well, I, I mean, I think philosophically, if you look at, if you look at the history of lighting, um, you know, the low key lights, um, you know, particularly like the cinema of the forties are, are associated with glamor. Mm. You know, when you have eye light, when you have, when you have, uh, modeled, you know, mod, what we call model light, uh, on someone's faces or, you know, I mean, even from, you know, predating cinema, uh, you know, you look at Rembrandt or Caravaggio, you know, the, they were using model formed light, uh, but it's primarily driven towards glamor or, you know, sort of, uh, glamorizing somebody's face. And, and in many cases, particularly with the people that we were, uh, that, that our characters are interviewing, that was not something we wanted to do. Yeah. Uh, so we were, you know, we were one thinking about what the space looks like, but also thinking about, uh, conditions of the, of the environment and, and, and who this person's character is and, and how can we, uh, subtly illustrate that, um, with light without, you know, without being too, um, uh, without overextending our use of, of visual language to, you know. Plus it's gotta be realism story. too. When you're in offices and prisons and things like that, that's just how these places uh, are lit. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, you know, it's, we would turn stuff off and, you know, we would use top light and, and eliminate some of the front light. And we, you know, we would make certain aesthetic choices, of course, um, to make things more visually appealing, so to speak. Uh, you know, it's not like we just turned on all the overhead fluorescence and move the camera around. It's, you know, it's done with a little bit more, um, nuance than that. But, uh, but yeah, it's absolutely like, you know, realism and, and what the space was is, is key. A lighting artist on Twitter. Does Eric tend to expose the image as close to the final intent as possible, or is there some amount of pulling exposure in post? Yeah, we, we worked really hard to get the dailies pipeline and the onset monitoring as close to the, the final grade as we could. Uh, we weren't doing any, any onset grading because we kind of got our color palette down and, and we didn't feel like we had to influence things one way or the, the other in the grade so much because most of that work is done through production design, color of light and, and costumes. But, uh, but yeah, we, we would, uh, we would get the onset LUTs, uh, such that we could expose with a, uh, I could expose the camera with a light meter. Um, the dailies would come out as, as prescribed. And then in the grade, the, you know, it was, it was the, uh, pretty much the same density all the way through the pipeline. So it was, you know, it takes some, that's, that's really what testing is about. And we've got two questions here that I don't, I don't totally understand the question. So maybe you do, um, Desiree Bressend on Instagram, how do you set up or use complicated temperature light, like blue in a happy scene? Well, I mean, color, I think color is obviously a huge, huge part of how the audience, you know, interprets the scene. So, and you know, throughout cinema and throughout photography, the color blue has been associated with sadness, I think, you know, and has been used that way. Um, I don't necessarily think of color emotionally. I think about it contextually in terms of daytime mm -hmm. um, or, you know, what time of day is it? What, what is the, uh, if it's, you know, if it's a morning scene, it means the, the writer intended to write it as a morning scene because it, it's important that the audience understand that it's morning, you know, that it's the next day in the, in the, in the show or, or someone is just w waking up or someone is hung over from the night before and we have to have hard light hitting their face. You know, yeah. that, that's where, that's where I would use color and, and, and quality of light to assist with the storytelling. I didn't really, I don't really subscribe to the idea that color, um, has a lot to do with the, with the audience's, uh, understanding of, of the emotional content of the scene. I mean, I think that's really up to the performers, you know, hmm. And the, and the, you know, um, and the editor, to be honest. That's interesting. We actually have a question. Uh, I think it, that's about that. A uh, Fincher analyst on Twitter, why not use magenta pink? Um, sounds like it's a, another color question. Uh, just basically asking why didn't you, yeah, why didn't you I, go that direction? I, I mean, I think that's, that's a, 
magenta and pink are are was was one of the colors we chose to exclude from the from the the palette of the show. Um, you know, I think both David and I, it's you know, would probably list it as uh, one of our favorite colors. Um, but that's you know, it's more about sort of picking a palette for the show and moving with it, you know, and, and committing to it, I think. And you mm-hmm. say, okay, you know, if you're a painter, if you're a photographer, if you're a, a, an architect, if you're a, a, a cinematographer, you know, you choose your palette and you, and you say, this is what the show is going to be. And, and I think that that is part of, you know, consistency and stylistic and intent and, and sensibility uh, and taste. And so it's, you know, we, we made certain choices of colors that we were going to embrace and and other colors we were we were going to exclude and, and and that color is one of them. Right at the beginning of this conversation you talked about uh, making the decision of what you're not going to do. It seems like a common thread here for you and maybe your work even outside of Mindhunter because you've mentioned it a bunch of times you talked about selecting a lens, you know, a lens package and just staying within those boundaries, staying within color boundaries, staying within camera movement boundaries. It it feels like there's something kind of exciting to you about having those set limitations and then really excelling with the tools that you allow yourself. Am I reading too far into it? No, no, absolutely. I mean, I think, look, the the audience knows we can do anything, right? They know that we can, we can put Sandra Bullock in space. They've seen it. It works. They believe it. They know that we can, you know, take people to the center of the earth. They, you know, uh, they know they, they can be trans transported back to, to world war one and buy it. So I, I don't think it's healthy for any filmmaker to have the option to do anything at any given time. Mm. Um, you know, one, it's, it's overwhelming. It's just, you know, it's tremendously overwhelming. It's a lot easier if you have a roadmap in my opinion of saying, okay, here's what we're not going to do. Here's, here's what we're striving towards. And, you know, if you look at, if you look at cinema and you look at the movies that you admire or the movies that you respond to related to a specific project, it's it's easy to it's it's easy to say oh they did they don't have a lot of crane shots I'm not going to have a lot of crane shots mm. oh they're not moving the camera a lot they're 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 cutting okay I want to do that too or oh they, they've only used these six colors or they're only using top light or they're only using hard light through the windows or whatever I'm going to make those choices as well and then when you walk into the set and you have to make those decisions you don't have to be like, oh, well, I could put soft light through the windows or I could hard light through the windows or it could be pink or it could be magenta or it could be purple or it could be green. You know, say, oh, well, obviously it's it's going to be this and I'm going to do this and I'm going to do this because I have a I have a, a roadmap in place that I've, I've put together with the director and the production designer and, you know, the other creative people behind the project. Um, and and that makes the that informs the entire process uh, in a really elegant way. So, yeah, I, I, I really believe that. For sure. And I, I think it's, the, you know, for me anyway, it's the best way to work. I mean, everyone has their own method, but but it, for me, it works great. Well, Eric, I can't thank you enough for being on Go Creative Show. The show, Mindhunter is just so good. You know that. Everybody knows that. That's why we have thank so you. much attention being paid to it. Um, what is the deal with season three? I'm nervous because I saw an article here on January 15th. Netflix, um, you know, told TV line that it's on an indefinite hold. And that was January 15th, kind of before everything started going crazy with COVID. So can you give us a little bit of insight into what is going on with season three? You know, I don't know. I, I, I can't say specifically because I don't know. Um, you know, David, uh, David and I just finished the movie. He, he was uh, busy with the movie. And um, what was it? Of, he's what was in, it called? It's called Mank. It's called Mank. And um, it's a feature for Netflix. And, and he's in the process of post on that film right now. So. Uh, you know, he had other projects in in place that that uh, needed his attention, and uh, I think he felt like it was necessary to just take a, take a step back so we could focus on those other projects. And and hopefully, hopefully, we get get to come back and do a third season. I would love I would love to do it. You know, I love everybody there. They're they're like family to me. So so uh, you know, fingers crossed with the rest of the fans for sure. I mean, it's got to be highly unlikely this doesn't go for a third season. That's how can, why, why would that happen? It's crazy. Yeah. I, I, I don't know. I, you know, that's uh, that is certainly above my pay grade, but I, I know everybody <laughs> involved is, uh, is, is eager to get back to work on, on the show. It was, uh, you know, special, special, uh, experience for everybody. Well, we didn't even get so. to talk about your film work or anything beyond Mindhunter, but I think that's just a testament to how great this show is that we can fill up an entire hour plus just yapping about it. So, 
Um, thank you again so much for being on. And where can people go to learn more about you? What do you want to plug before we part ways here? Oh, thank you. Well, thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure. Um, you can follow me on Instagram. It's, it's easy. It's just my first initial last name. So it's at E. Messerschmidt. And, uh, and yeah, keep an eye, keep an eye on Netflix or, or, uh, or whatever's coming up, coming up next. So I love how you said, oh, it's, it's easy. The easy part of your name is the first <laughs> part of your name. It should be Eric.m. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> Eric Fair Messerschmidt, enough. ASC. You can find links to him and the show and all things related to Eric on our uh, page at Go Creative Show. Eric, thank you so much for being on. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. All right, there he goes. Eric Messerschmidt, ASC, Director of Photography for Mindhunter. I want to thank you so much, Eric, for being on the show and sharing your experiences. I learned a lot. I know you guys did too, and I cannot wait to hear your reaction to this episode. I also want to thank Matt Russell for mixing and mastering and making the show sound so good. You can find him at gainstructure.com, at gainstructure, and on Twitter, at gainstructure. Easy. You can also follow our producer, Connor Crosby. He is always behind the scenes, making everything happen for us here at Go Creative Show. And you can find him at Ignition Visuals, ignitionvisuals.com. And follow me at Ben Consoli. If you like this kind of behind the scenes stuff, I have been pouring a lot of attention into my Instagram, doing stories, showing behind the scenes clips, what I'm working on, what's happening. So if you're interested at all in my own work, follow me there at Ben Consoli. Of course, all things Go Creative Show at gocreativeshow.com. You get it all there. You can link to our Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and our YouTube. And while I'm talking about YouTube, let me know what you think of how we're incorporating video into the show. It's a work in progress. So I would love to have your opinions and your thoughts as we figure out what to do here on the video front. All right, that's that. Oh, no, what am I saying? I forgot all about our sponsor, MZ, Education for Creative. Please support our sponsors. We love them. They love us. They love you. And we want you to love them too. So take advantage of their promotions and everything that's going on there at mz.com. All right. I want to thank you guys once again for listening. And don't forget to subscribe to us on your favorite podcast app so you never miss an episode of Go Creative Show, a podcast for filmmakers. 